What's up, my name is Michael, I'm a teacher, and today we're learning about terrifying facts about Maori warriors. I know absolutely nothing about Maori warriors. I believe they're from New Zealand, like a Polynesian group of people. I haven't seen the video, but what I'm expecting and what I think Maori warriors are, uh, Maori, aren't they the guys from like New Zealand who use their tongue and like ugh, make scary faces? I've seen it in rugby sometime. Let's see how wrong I am, here we go. I'm Simon Whistler, you're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today we're looking at the top 10 up, terrifying Simon? facts about- Oh, 720p. Doesn't get better. Sorry. Maori warriors. Maori. 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 Number 10. Their tattoos were carved in. Tattoos held a special significance to the Maori people, and both men and women would get them. The most common place to get them was the face. Isn't it like you have a bamboo stick with a little needle and you slap the bamboo stick onto the skin? I had a chance to do it in Thailand once, I didn't, and I regret it. I wish I tried it. But some Maori people were known to get their necks, torsos, and arms tattooed as well. Most Maoris started getting their tattoos during adolescence. Each design was unique, but generally they were in the shape of spirals. They were tattooed on during a ceremony, and each line showed the person's bravery and strength. After all, these tattoos weren't yeah, put on using a needle way. gun. Instead, they were carved into the skin using a mallet and a chisel that was made from bone, and the ink was made from ash and fat. This left the skin with grooves like a record instead of being smooth like modern tattoos. Number 9. Wow, the war I dance. Know that. One of the most notable traditions used by- That's still- Yeah, that was what I was talking about. This is so damn cool. I don't watch rugby a lot, but whenever we have the Olympics, I watch it. It's pretty cool. And Maori Warriors- I mean, we don't really play it in Sweden, and it's not really on European television. Maybe in Britain? I don't know. We don't have the access to it, so- And still used by many of their national sports teams That's today- the tongue. Is the traditional native dance called the haka. During haka. the dance, the participants say a chant, stamp their feet, stick out their tongues, and bulge out their eyes. While the dance was often performed to welcome special guests, it was actually developed for war. The dance was used in two different ways. The first is that it was used to intimidate their opponents. The other way it was used was that it was performed before a battle during a ritual. If there was something wrong with the dance, then the elders were sure that it was a bad omen. This gave them the chance to either abandon or modify their plans. Number 8. The Mere Club was used to crack skulls. The Mere Club was the most common weapon used by Maori warriors. It was in the shape of a teardrop and made from bone, jade, or stone. They were often decorated- I was about to say, it looks like jade. Or like a cactus uh, leaf. Cactus? Cacti? It is and considered heirlooms since it took so long to craft one. They are a club? But how big is it? Are a blunt Looks force weapon small. and were used in close range fighting. Often a Maori warrior would attack- And if it's made out of jade, it can't be that big, can it? ...an opposing tribesman by swinging the mere club down on his shoulder. This would hopefully break the collarbone or dislocate or break the shoulder. Then uh. their opponents would be unable to defend himself against a blow to the head, often to the temple. Behind the temple is the tarian, which is the weakest point of the skull. Since the skull is so thin there, it usually only took one blow to that area to kill an opposing warrior. Number 7. The dead were buried and dug back up again and then reburied. The Maori had a very unusual method for burying their dead. Starting early in their culture, the Maori people began to bury people twice. First, after a week or two of mourning, the body was wrapped in mats and then would be buried and allowed to decompose. Then, a year later, the bodies were dug up and the bones were scraped to remove any remaining flesh. The bones were then painted with red ochre, which is a natural pigment, and taken to different settlements where they once again mourned the dead. So. This, to me, is similar what they do with elephants in Thailand. I spent two months in the middle of the jungle in Thailand, uh, five or six years ago, and I lived with elephants at an elephant sanctuary, and they taught me that when an elephant died, they buried it. So, you know, worms, maggots, whatever, like, uh, his, the elephant's flesh would decompose and get rid of, and after like seven or eight years, only the skeleton would be left, and they would dig it up, collect all the, the bones and then they would bury the bones only at a special like cemetery elephant cemetery place sort of now you know how they bury elephants <laughs> we're learning about mori warriors goddamn then there was another ceremony before they were buried again in a sacred place right. once the second burial was complete the person's soul would go on to their mysterious afterlife number six the war strategy a war party called a hapu usually never consisted of more than 100 men, and in some cases women fought as well. 
Sometimes multiple hapus would come together, but with more warriors, they became less organized. Warriors were also trained from a young age, and every male was trained as a warrior. One specific thing they worked on was wrist strength. This would make their weapons, like the mir, much more effective. How the Maoris would attack other tribes is by traveling to enemy settlements quietly or pretending they were out. Is this the club that he mentioned before? I can't imagine it being made out of jade. Or maybe it was something they attached to it. This might be something completely different and I'm ignorant, I'm sorry. On a hunting expedition, once they got close, they would attack often at dawn. All the men were killed because this eliminated the chance that any tribesmen could come back and seek- Oh, that's the club, right? It has to be. Okay, I get it. The women were also taken as a prize of war. That's a fancy club. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Number five, <laughs> heads of the killed were taken as trophies. Heads held a special significance to the Maori people, and they were known to take the heads of their fallen enemies. Once they had the heads, they would remove the brain and the eye. They're not the only ones. Uh, it's been done throughout other cultures as well. It was sort of like identification back in the day. If you killed someone, you had to prove it that you took the person's head because it's easier to carry than the body and you would show the head to uh, whoever had ordered the kill. I know some samurais did it, uh, some people during medieval times as well, so it's not entirely uncommon and weird. Sometimes during the medieval times you would fill your catapults with heads and throw them over the wall at your enemy to scare them. So heads are popular and humans are fascinating. The eyes. Next, all the orifices were oh, sealed disgusting. with flax fiber and gum. The head was then boiled or steamed in an oven. Then the heads were dried in the sun for several days, and they were treated with shark oil. One reason why they kept the heads of their enemies was that so they could mock it later. One missionary said he watched one chief say to the head of an enemy chief, Dane, You wanted to run away, didn't you? But my green stone club overtook you, and after you were cooked, you were made food for me. And where is your father? He is cooked. And where is your brother? He is eaten. And where is your wife? There she sits. A wife for me. Were they cannibals? And where are your children? There they are, loads on their backs, carrying food as my slaves. If that wasn't insulting enough, they also developed a bizarre game with the heads. They would pile them in a heap and then set the head of the principal chief on the top of the pile. Then, using stones or other heads, they took turns trying to knock off the head at the top of the pile. Number four, Captain James Cook's first encounter was terrifying. The first encounter between the Europeans and the Maori was in December of 1646, when a Dutch ship made landfall near a Maori tribe. Both groups were standoffish, and this led to a small fight that resulted in deaths on both sides. After the run-in, the Dutch sailed off, and Europeans would not go back until October 1767, when English navigator James Cook traveled there looking for the fabled Fourth Continent. When Captain Cook first encountered the Maori, they sent out two war canoes to meet them. When the canoes approached, two full-grown Maori warriors, complete with face tattoos, stood up and held the shrunken heads of their latest opponents, who were also covered with tattoos. Oh, yeah. Cook and his crew immediately noticed the detail on the faces and knew the heads were real. Cook wanted to interact with the Maori peacefully, but the was that like a scare tactic or like a peace offering? Or like, here you guys, you can have these. There were some misunderstandings, and the Maori acted aggressively. As a result, the Europeans were supposedly forced to kill a few Maori in self-defense, much to the dismay of Cook. To convince them that they had come in peace, Cook and his men ended up kidnapping some Maori warriors. They acted kindly to them and then let them go. This led to a better relationship between the Maori and the Europeans, which would play an important role in the shaping of New Zealand. Number three, the good old kidnap, treat them well, and let them go. That's how you spread diseases to indigenous people. Their most famous warrior, Hongi Hika. It is believed that the most famous Maori chief, Hongi Hika, was born in 1778. As a young man, he was a fierce and agile warrior who rose up through the ranks of his tribe. His chief got along with the Europeans and also saw the value of muskets in warfare. The chief managed to trade with the Europeans for several guns and ammo in 1808. The tribe then got into a war with another tribe. Hika's tribe fired off their first shots with their muskets, but the problem with the muskets is that they take at least 20 seconds to reload. The other so, tribe used this time to attack. Many members of Hika's tribe, including the chief, were slaughtered. Hongi Hika was one of the lucky few to get away. With the chief dead, Hongi Hika was the most senior, so he took control of the tribe. The defeat, however, could have well discouraged Hongi Hika from using muskets. However, he had the foresight to see that muskets could be an incredibly important part of warfare. So he got closer to the Europeans, even visiting Australia and England, where he became a bit of a sensation because of his tattoos. He even converted to Christianity and set up the first Christian mission in New Zealand. 
This relationship to the church gave Honkihika access to more rifles because he vowed to become a defender of the church. However, he wasn't simply given all the guns, instead trading for them. As for what the Europeans wanted in exchange for the guns, well, that was... Not sure how terrifying this fact is. Sounds like a cool guy, but... Shrunken heads. In fact, as the trade became more common, slaves and prisoners of war were brought to the Europeans and they chose which heads they wanted. The Maori then tattooed the chosen victim and decapitated them. The market got... Uh, okay. Yeah, that's a bit more terrifying. Not so flooded with Maori heads that they were being sold for as little as two pounds, which was about a week's wage in England for a working man. Nevertheless, Hongihiko was able to amass over 3,000 guns and plenty of ammo and gunpowder in his 10 years as chief. Starting in 1818, his tribe slaughtered other tribes and took their women. Within a year, he had complete control over northern New Zealand. However, other tribes soon followed in Hongihika's footsteps and bought their own guns. Hongihika was killed when he took a bullet in the lung in 1828. Number 2. Infanticide like other warrior cultures, the Maoris committed infanticide. Females were more likely to be killed because tribes needed more males, since every male was a warrior and there needed to be a decent number of warriors to ensure the security of the They are not the only culture in our history who's practiced that. The tribe. Also, males were more likely to be killed in battle, meaning that there would have been an upset in the sex ratios later in life. Infanticide was also common if there was anything wrong with the baby. Essentially, there were five ways that the infants were killed. Their skulls could be crushed, they could be drowned in a stone basin, strangulation, suffocation, or finally, the most disturbing way was that the mothers would press against the soft spot on the skull and kill the baby instantly. Oh, that's disgusting. Oh, that's absolutely vulgar. Babies are squishy. So yeah, you could probably squish a baby's skull without any problems with ease. I don't know why babies are squishy. It's because like uh, if they fall, they don't get hurt. Probably has to do with birth. It would suck to birth a, a baby with full grown, uh, as full grown skeleton. Well, probably. Isn't that cheery? Hey, we can't say we didn't warn you. Terrifying is right there in the title. Number one, they performed cannibalism. Whether the Maori. So that was my question. He is ripped. Warriors committed cannibalism or not is highly debated. Some historians believe that it was just Europeans trying to paint the Maoris as wild savages. However, besides witness accounts of cannibalism, tribal oral histories and archaeological evidence also strongly suggest that the Maori warriors indulged in cannibalizing vanquished enemies. There are a few reasons that the Maori ate their opponents, and it wasn't because they were hungry. One was to internalize their spirit, which they called mana. Another theory is that cannibalism was part of their post-battle rage. Another is that it would send a message to enemies. They thought that the greatest humiliation you could do your enemy was to kill them, chop them up, eat them, and then excrete them out. So I really hope you yeah, enjoyed probably. that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. There's a button on the screen as well as below this video. And if you really like this video, why not check out some of our other videos that are over there on the right. One is the top 10 Viking warriors and below that we've got the top 10 horrifying facts that you didn't know about knights. So be sure to check both of those out. Be sure I want to do the one with Viking warriors. So cool. I'm not sure if you said it in the video and I forgot, but how old is the culture? Like, for how long have Maori warriors or the people existed for? And I'm not entirely sure of how terrifying these facts are. Yes, some were very disgusting. But a lot of these things are, have been common practice in other cultures throughout history. Face tattoos, other cultures as well. Killing uh, babies, infants, uh, other cultures as well. Chopping heads off, other cultures as well. Now, that's very fascinating, even though we're far apart and we had no communication with each other like thousands of years ago, we still acted the same throughout the globe. That's very fascinating. You can find evidence of that if you just look at the pyramids. You have pyramids all over the globe for some reason, and they had no means of communicating with each other. They didn't know about each other. So it's really cool. All right, that was Maori Warriors, and if you want to make me the coolest teacher in school, you can subscribe. My students would love it. Take care, and bye-bye.